welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. If you are watching this as a recording, um, that's fine too. We just want to definitely make sure that everyone gets this very pertinent um, information from USD. So I'm going to introduce uh, Jackie Burkett and Kelly Nearing. Um, Kelly's going to get started at the first half and then Jackie will finish up afterwards. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat box. If um, while Kelly is giving her presentation, if uh, Jackie can answer any of the questions, she will be able to do that directly into the chat box. If there's anything that she's a little bit unsure of or she would prefer that Kelly answer, then we will do that afterwards in Q&A. All right, so um, Kelly, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here tonight. I wish it was in person, but you know, this, this works too. I have a lot of information to share, but of course we'll have time for Q and a, you know, throw those questions in the chat and we will definitely get all of your questions answered tonight. So, um, I don't want you to feel rushed or anything like that. I'm going to throw a lot of information at you, but by all means, please ask any and all questions. So I am the director of financial aid at USD. And I just celebrated eight years at USD this month, actually. So I, I love USD. I love all things USD. Um, I actually did some research on your school today. And wow, you have a beautiful campus. And I, I, I've never been there in person, but it looks gorgeous. And perhaps someday I will be there. So let's go ahead and get started. Oh, goodness. I'm not moving forward. Here we go. So tonight we're going to talk about how to apply for financial aid. We are going to discuss the federal verification process. I am going to explain what EFC, COA, and federal need are. All of that will make complete sense in about 20 minutes. We're of course gonna talk about the Torero Promise, the types of financial aid available at USD, how to apply for outside scholarships, and of course, time for questions. So, when it comes to applying for financial aid, you are submitting one financial aid application every year. The vast majority of you will be submitting what's called the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, better known as the FAFSA. If you are an undocumented student, you would be submitting the California Dream Act application if you are attending high school in California, or for our out-of-state folks, that's going to be the USD Dream Act application. We're going to focus on the FAFSA today, but I just wanted you to be aware that there are these other applications out there. You're not submitting all three. You're only submitting one. And today we're going to focus on the FAFSA. So first I want to show you what the website looks like. There are multiple FAFSA websites out there. So I want you to see this so that when you go to apply next week, actually, you will see this and you will remember that you've seen it before. You know that this is where you need to be. So you can see that this is the Federal Student Aid and Office of the U.S. Department of Education website up in that upper left-hand corner. You're going to see that uh, symbol, if you will, or the, kind of that, those, that branding on a lot of the federal sites so that you know you're in the right place. So this is the FAFSA website. You're going to apply online every year. This is what it looks like when you go to renew your FAFSA application for your sophomore through senior year. You don't have to input as much information, but you're going to the same site every year. This is the California Student Aid Commission website. This is where you would be going to fill out the California Dream Act application. This is going to be for our undocumented students going to high school in California. So when you fill out the FAFSA application, you are doing that every single year and you're doing it about a year in advance from when you're actually going to be enrolled. So, on October 1st, next week, the FAFSA application is going to open for the 2021-22 academic year. So if you're a senior right now, that's going to be your first year in college. That's going to be next fall and the spring of 2022. So that application period opens October 1st, and there is a California deadline of March 2nd. That is just for California. If you're planning to apply to schools outside of California, there might be other deadlines. So that's something you want to check on with each individual university. So October 1st, it will open. It's due March 2nd. I suggest filling it out in October. If you fill it out in October versus February, you're not really receiving any more funds, but you definitely don't want to miss the March 2nd deadline. 
students who attend a California high school may be eligible for the Cal Grant. I hope you have heard of that. If you miss that March 2nd deadline, you will not be eligible for the Cal Grant. It's very important that you make that deadline. So if you're getting this done in October, you're good to go. Now, in order to sign the FAFSA electronically, parents and students are going to need what's called an FSA ID. Parents, if you have an older student in college, perhaps you already have one of these, but both parent and student will need their unique, their own FSA ID. You're gonna use it year after year to sign the FAFSA. You're gonna use it in order to borrow loans if that's something that you wanna do. So something to hold on to, keep in a safe spot, something that you will need. Parents, if you have children younger than, you know, if this is your first student going to college and you have younger children, you are gonna use that same FSA ID for all of your children. Now, a couple of years ago, the financial aid industry had a huge shift in that we started using what's called prior prior year tax data on the FAFSA versus just one year back. And I know that sounds kind of funny, prior prior year, but once you say it a couple of times, it, it rolls off the tongue. But basically the FAFSA is going to be asking for tax information from two years back. And I did create a chart to kind of show you what that looks like, which I will show you in just a moment. But I want you to be aware that we realize that the financial situation in your family happening now or happening when your student attends college may not be what was happening two years ago. And so schools do have an appeal process in place, but that's at the school level. So when you're inputting the information on the FAFSA, if you're thinking to yourself, gosh, what happened in 2019 is nowhere near what's happening in 2021, that's okay but you're not going to appeal appeal through the FAFSA, you're actually gonna do that at the, at the university. All schools do it a little bit differently, so that's something you're going to wanna to reach out to the university directly to figure out how you complete that process. So this is the chart that I created to show you that you are using tax information from one year, applying in a different year for enrollment during a different year. So for those of you that are seniors, you're going to be filling out the FAFSA next week in 2020 for the 21-22 academic year, and you're using 2019 tax information. So this will show you what will be happening the next four years. If you have students that are younger, of course it will be different, but um, you know, for our high school seniors, this is what's going to be, what it's going to look like over the next four years. And like I mentioned, there is that appeal process where you can base your financial aid eligibility on what's currently happening in your family as opposed to two years ago. So there is a process called federal verification, and this is a process that is run by the Department of Education. The Department of Education will randomly select students to be verified. And that means that schools or universities have to verify the information that families input on the FAFSA. There, there's nothing that you can do or not do to, to not get selected. There's nothing that you did wrong if you did get selected. It just means that we have to verify the ta tax data and other data that you input on the FAFSA. For the first year in college, this is really important to note because many schools will offer an estimated offer of financial aid, meaning you will be able to see what your offer of financial aid is, even if you're selected for verification. Not all schools do this, but if you attend USD, we do do this. And that means that your offer is not finalized until the verification documents come in. It is a really hard conversation to have when a student commits to USD based off of this, you know, XYZ offer of financial aid, but they did not know they were selected for verification. The documents come in at the end of the summer. The financial aid offer changes for the worse. They've already committed to USD and the financial, eligi financial aid eligibility has changed. So if you are selected for verification, you will know it when you submit the FAFSA. The schools that you're hoping to attend will let you know, but it's really important that you submit that verification data as soon as possible. We can't finalize your offer of financial aid until all of that comes in. March 2nd is the deadline. Typically around May or June is when you're going to be committing to the university. So in that short time frame, we want to try to get the verification complete so that you are committing to USD or another university based on the offer of financial aid that is finalized. I realize that's a lot of information. The key takeaway here is to check and see if you're selected. If you are, 
turn in those documents to the university as soon as possible. Some students are selected every year, some students are never selected. So now I wanna talk through how we determine financial aid eligibility. There are three factors that come into play here. The EFC, which is the expected family contribution, the cost of attendance, which we're gonna call the COA, and then the calculation to determine need. So let's focus on the expected family contribution first. We call that the EFC, and that is calculated using all of the data that you input on the FAFSA. So many families think that this is a dollar amount that they have to you know, make a check out for to the university, and, and it's not. I really want you to think of it as kind of like a credit score. It's a, a measure of a family's financial strength or their ability to pay. And we use that number to determine financial aid eligibility. So when you input all of the information on the FAFSA, the Department of Ed will run you through this need analysis to determine your EFC. That number goes with you wherever you attend school. So your EFC would be the same at USD as it would be at San Diego State University. So that is something that is unique to you and your FAFSA and goes with you to whatever school you attend. Now, the EFC is primarily driven by what I've listed here, the parents and student if they work, adjusted gross income, the household size, assets and investments that are outside of the family's primary residence, the age of the older parent, and the number of students in college. That is key when it comes to how financial aid eligibility could change from year to year, and we're gonna get into that later. So you fill out the FAFSA, they run you through the need analysis, and you have your EFC. So that's, that's the first number that we wanna remember. Now, the second piece is the cost of attendance, or what we call the COA, and that is determined by each university. So that is something that's gonna be unique to the institution that you attend. Remember, your EFC goes with you wherever you go, but the cost of attendance is gonna be different at each university you attend. So there are both fixed costs and variable costs that are part of the COA. Fixed costs are gonna be things that are paid directly to the university. So this is going to be things like tuition fees and room and board for on-campus housing. Then there are variable costs that are not paid directly to the university, but they are part of the cost of attendance so that we can offer financial aid to help assist with those costs. That's going to be books and supplies, transportation, and personal necessities. If you are living at home or you're living in an off-campus apartment where you're paying rent, then there would be housing costs as part of your variable costs because we want to offer you financial aid for all of the costs associated with attending school. So we combine the fixed cost with the variable cost to create the cost of attendance. So now that we know the expected family contribution, we know the cost of attendance, we can determine federal need. So we take the total cost of attendance, subtract the EFC, and that gives us a student's federal financial need. And that, along with the EFC, are the key drivers in determining financial aid eligibility. So the great thing about the Torero Promise is that USD will meet 100% of that financial need with grant funding, federal work study, and a subsidized student loan. So back over here, we, you know, we did the math with the cost of attendance minus EFC equals the federal financial need. And with the Torero Promise, 100% of that need is met with work study, grants, and a subsidized student loan. This is unlike any other financial aid offer that we offer at USD. No other student is receiving 100% of their need met. And outside of the Torero Promise, the first year that a student enters USD, their financial aid offer is locked in, for lack of a better word. It could always go down if a family's finances become better, if you will, but it can never go up. So with the Torero Promise, we're recalculating eligibility every year. So that, that number could go up as you, as you go through, through your years at USD. It's an amazing program. It's the best financial aid offers that we offer to any student at USD. And it's really a, a great way for, for you all to attend USD. These are the types of financial aid that we offer at USD. In the grants and scholarships column, that's all of the free money that, that we offer. Some of it is need-based, some of it is not, which I will explain in a moment. Some of it is based off of the information on the FAFSA, some of it is not. So you'll see there that there's merit scholarships listed. Merit scholarships are based on 
yes, some financial data, but more so based on you as a student. And I'm guessing Jackie may talk, yes, yeah, she's nodding. We'll talk more about merit scholarships later, but I just want you to be aware that it's factored into the offer of financial aid, but it's not primarily driven by the FAFSA information. We also offer the Federal Work Study Program, which is an opportunity for students to work on campus. And you're working for departments on campus, so they recognize that you're a student first. And, you know, weird class schedules or uh, exam schedules, you know, they're very accommodating with that. It's an amazing program. It is a need-based program, but um, I actually started as a work study student in the Office of Financial Aid at my undergraduate institution. Now I'm the director at USD, so you never know what could happen. Better work study is a great opportunity. Okay, off my soapbox for that. And then we offer four different loans. Three are student loans, one is a parent loan. Here's a little bit more information about the loans. Our USD trust loan is for our California high school graduates. It has a 0% interest rate and USD is the lender, so that's who you're paying back after graduation. The federal direct subsidized loan is also need-based and there's no interest while you're in school. The interest rate is set by the Department of Education in July every year and there is a six month grace period after graduation for repayment. The federal direct unsubsidized loan is a student loan but there is interest accruing while you're in school. And then we offer the federal parent plus loan which is a loan taken out by the parent on the student's behalf. So I, I've been mentioning need-based versus non-need-based, and in our calculation, when we did the cost of attendance minus EFC to equal federal need, anything in our need-based column is aid that has to fit within that number. So that's going to be the vast majority of federal and state grants, as well as our USD grant, the direct subsidized loan, and the work-study program. Anything in the non-need-based financial aid column, it can exceed the need or you don't even have to fill out a FAFSA to get it. So if you don't fill out a FAFSA but you're eligible for a merit scholarship, that's okay. You don't have to have a FAFSA on file for that. So I just wanted you to see the difference between the two columns and understand when we throw around these terms of need-based versus non-need-based, you now know that you can only qualify for need-based financial aid if you demonstrate demonstrate, excuse me, federal need. For some of you, your expected family contribution might be higher than our cost of attendance, so you would only be eligible for aid that's in that non-need-based column. For, for the others of you, that your expected family contribution may be below our cost of attendance, and you would be eligible for the need-based aid. The lowest expected family contribution is zero. It can't be in the negatives, so someone could potentially have our full cost of attendance as their need. For this current academic year, our cost of attendance for an undergraduate student living on campus is about $72,000 for the year. So with a zero F EFC, your federal need would be the full $72,000 and, and USD would meet 100% of that need with grant aid, work study, and the subsidized loan. So i would mentioned that you're filling out that FAFSA every year and your financial aid eligibility could change from year to year. These are the biggest reasons why you would see a huge change. For many families, there's multiple students going to college at once, but you know, students graduate, they enter at different times, and that can change eligibility. So if you have a child in college and, and perhaps this child's going to be your second, then for the one or two years they're in at the same time, their financial aid eligibility will be better. When an older sibling graduates, then the current child in college, their financial aid eligibility could change. This can come as a, a pretty big shock to family sometimes, so I wanna put it out there now. If you have multiple children that you know will overlap, but at certain times you may only have one in college, I want you to be aware that that year, the aid eligibility will be different. Other changes could be changes in the, the family structure or income. Another big thing is when a single parent marries, because at that point we have to include the step parents information, regardless of the kind of agreement that, you, that you've established with who's paying what for what child. As soon as the custodial parent is legally married, we have to include the step parent information. 
So I want to shift gears a little bit from financial aid to scholarships. It's all funding that can be used to help pay for tuition, books, everything. But with the scholarships, you have to apply for each one individually. So in order to apply for financial aid, you're filling out that one application, most likely the FAFSA. But with scholarships, you have to apply to each one, and each one is going to have different eligibility requirements. So on our financial aid website, there is a link to scholarships, and here you can see there's university scholarships, outside scholarships, and scholarship search engines. All things that we vetted, we know they're not going to scam you. We know that you can, you know, apply to them at any time. So for those of you that are seniors right now, you want to start this process now. You don't have to wait to be admitted to USD to start this process. You want to start now and you want to continue to search for scholarships the whole time you're enrolled. So, and just a little side note, if you don't go to USD, you can still use our search engines. So if you click on outside scholarships, you can search by date and you'll be able to put them in date order of when the deadline for their application is due. So it's September, I would start there. And as we go through time, you want to look about a year out because as you've learned, application deadlines come a year in advance, six months to a year in advance, if you will. So something you want to be checking now and continue to check the whole time you're enrolled. A couple of scholarship reminders. Like the financial aid application, all scholarship applications should be free. You should never ever have to pay money in order to receive funding for college. If you come across a website that says, for $100, we guarantee a $1,000 scholarship. It is a scam. Please, please, please do not do it. It should all be free. I'm hoping that for seniors, you've been involved. If you haven't, you want to get involved now. If you are a junior, a sophomore, a first year, a freshman, an eighth grader, get involved now. You want to monitor your online presence, of course. And even though it sounds kind of old school, you don't want to limit yourself to internet searches only. There are, there's funding out there that you wouldn't think is there. And so it really takes the proactive student to ask around to find funding. And I know that, you know, that $72,000 cost of attendance can seem glaring and a $500 scholarship seems like, how's that going to help me? But they add up. So, you know, in order to make USD a reality, you really have to think of all of the options. You're, you're filling out the FAFSA and you are hopefully getting some grant money from perhaps the feds, the state of California, the university. Maybe you qualify for a merit scholarship. You're going to do the federal work study program and work on campus. You are going to borrow a little bit in student loans. You are going to apply for outside scholarships. And so when you add all of that up, two, three, four, five hundred dollar scholarships that are renewable for four years, that adds up. And that could be the make or break point of making USD a reality. So I highly suggest you search for those outside scholarships. USD students brought in over 2 million in outside scholarships last year. So, you know, attending USD, the students are stellar. I know that. And so I know that there are scholarships out there for you, but you have to be the ones to find them. So one last thing before we do Q&A, this is the Office of Financial Aid homepage which, and our resources tab. So we have some guides listed there that will explain how to apply, how to reapply, go over everything that I touched on today and then some. So if you need some additional information after the fact, you can definitely find it there. With that, let's open it up for questions. Kelly, I'm going to go ahead and because I was actually really shocked at your chart. I, I had read on student aid, um, I think it had said for the 2021 FAFSA, um, which were in the 2021 school year, it's 2018 tax information. That's correct. So if we go back, because I was looking ahead. So for the 2021, like two, 2020, 2021, which is the current academic year, yes, it would have been 2018 tax information. So those are, those are our students who are in college right now. So not our seniors right now. Correct. So your seniors right now are applying in this 
October, October 1st, 2020, to attend in 2021-2022 using 2019 tax data. So it's, it's really confusing because when you say 2021, do you mean 2020-2021 or <laughs> I know. Right. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so your high school seniors are applying now for next fall using 2019. When you get in, I, when you get in there to fill it out, it'll tell you what to do. So you don't have to remember like which tax return am I pulling. It'll it'll tell you. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Actually, we have a question. Um, I think you mentioned this, but how early should a student start looking into everything? So even a student who's possibly a freshman. So just try to remember that you're applying for financial aid in your senior year of high school. Because, you know, if you, you would be a senior right now and you would be filling out the FAFSA in October for next fall. So you're applying for financial aid your senior year of high school. And I, I think that's a good time to start looking at scholarships as well. You could start that whole kind of financial process in the fall of your senior year. That's going to be different than admission applications. Those, are, those have different deadlines. But the financial aspect of it all, financial aid and scholarships, October of senior year of high school. Um, I can't, okay. Sorry, one more. Is the FSA ID generated in the FAFSA site when we begin the application or is it something else? It is. So if it's your first time, it will prompt you to create your FSA ID before you're able to, to complete the FAFSA the first time. I can't see the chat, so um, just That's throwing that out there. all that there is so far. Okay. So last call for questions for Kelly. Kelly is going to... Um, is going to leave and, but Jackie's staying and she's gonna do an overview of USD for us. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you so much, Kelly. This is Annette Zaleski, principal. I, I was running the Hi. campus because we're hoping to, um, eventually our numbers came down in Riverside a little bit, so we don't have an exact date of coming back yet, but we're feeling the, excitement in the air on uh, coming back to do some face-to-face -face learning. So parents were excited about that. We just have to keep getting those numbers down. But thank you so much. We're very, very grateful for the partnership that USD is um, working with us and the other Catholic school students um, in the regions. So thank you so much. We um, appreciate that. And I know several of our students, even though we have a small but mighty uh, senior class, are looking forward into the possibilities of USD. Thank you. My pleasure. Happy to be here. I feel like with financial aid, you don't really realize what you want to know until it's upon you. So mm -hmm. if there are questions after the fact, by all means, let us know and we're happy to help. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. So I'm going to go. I'm going to stay. I'm not sure what to do. <laughs> You can say it's up to you, Kelly. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off. Um, Jackie, let me know if there's anything um, that I need to follow up on. Great, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, Jackie, do you have um, perfect? <laughs> All right, uh, my turn. Uh, well, again, welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. My name's Jackie Burkett. I'm a senior admission counselor. I'm also a very proud alumna, the class of 2011. Uh, I majored in Spanish with a minor in biology, so I can certainly answer some questions on that. But now it's time to talk about USD. If you are not in our mailing list yet, I strongly encourage you to scan this QR 
QR code and get into our mailing list so we can send you updates about USD, about your application as well. I do suggest do not unsubscribe from our emails. This is how we send you updates on your application. This is how we'll notify you if you're admitted. Um, so do not unsubscribe. If you get sick of seeing our emails, feel free to delete them, uh, but definitely do not unsubscribe. So we are a private Catholic university. We were founded in 1949 by the Diocese of San Diego and the Sisters of the Sacred Heart. We started off as the San Diego College for Men, San Diego College for Women, and in 72, we combined to be what is now USD. Uh, so we are still quite a young university, but still rooted in that Catholic intellectual tradition that you all are familiar with. Uh, we really want our students to come onto our campus, be free intellectual things, we're really going to challenge everything that you know. We do have university ministry. It's a wonderful way to get involved in your faith, whether you're Catholic or you're not. Um, it's just really a great space to meet people that are very open, go on search retreats where you can really disconnect, go into nature and reconnect with your faith and your identity. We do offer daily mass Monday through Friday at 1215 every day in our Founders Chapel, which is what you see right here. It's just absolutely gorgeous. We also have masses on Sunday evenings at six and eight o'clock at night. So you do not have to wake up early to go to mass. You can go to mass later on in the evening and really enjoy your Sunday and finish it off right if you choose to do so. One of our founders, Mother Rosalie Hill, she had this idea that if she built a beautiful campus, it would draw people here. On campus, our students would find truth, within truth find goodness, and be able to spread that goodness around the world. So beauty, truth, and goodness is really what USD is all about, and it still runs with us today as we are the number six most beautiful campus in the nation, thanks to the Princeton Review. Well, let me tell you a little bit about our campus community. So we do have just shy of 6,000 undergraduates, about 2,600 grad and law students. So we're considered a mid-size university. I like to think we're kind of the right size because we're big enough to the point point where you will see new faces every day, but small enough that you're really able to build lasting relationships with your peers as well as your professors. 48% of our students come from out of state, 9% are international, so that does leave the rest Californians. 38% of our students identify as being students of color, and only about 40% of our students identify as being Catholic. So we really do have students coming from all across the globe, all different walks of life, and that is something that we celebrate on our campus. We have our United Front Multicultural Commons, which houses 33 different multicultural clubs and organizations. We have our Center for Inclusion and Diversity. We really want to try to expose our students to as many cultures as possible while they're on our campus, whether that come in the form of food, dance, theater, art, uh, speakers. When I was at USD as a student, the Dalai Lama came onto the campus to speak to us, uh, which was an incredible experience to say the least. But of course, the whole purpose of going off to college is to receive an education. Uh, so we definitely have a wide variety at USD to choose from. While we do have three different colleges on our campus, we have our School of Business, our School of Engineering, and our College of Arts and Sciences. Really think of us as one USD. So there are 42 different majors, about 54 different minors. So think of that as a buffet. And you get to pick and choose what you want to put on your plate. So while we will ask you on the common application what you're interested in studying, you're not bound to that. All of our first year students will start out as undeclared, regardless of what you put on the common app. We really want our students to have the flexibility to try things out, reaffirm what you want to go into, or you're someone like me who started bio pre-med, found out that she couldn't handle blood, and flip-flopped her major and her minor. So we really want our students to be able to have that flexibility to try things out or change their mind. And it's as simple as filling out a form to change your major. But we do have a wonderful school of business, and it houses some popular majors like accounting, finance, business administration, and marketing. 
We have a wonderful School of Engineering. It's only about six years old and it's already 13th in the nation for undergraduate engineering programs. We offer mechanical, electrical, industrial systems, as well as an integrated engineering major, which will cover all of that, as well as bio and software. Now, engineering is a little different at USD. It's going to be a four and a half year program, and that's because our students earn both a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science when they graduate. And then, of course, being a liberal arts university, we do have our College of Arts and Sciences, which houses some popular majors like biology, psychology, communications, and political science, just to name a few. But being a liberal arts university means that you're not only going to be studying courses within your major, but courses within everything else as well, from fine arts, math, science, philosophy, English. Uh, we do require two semesters of theology as a part of our core curriculum, and that can be in whatever background you'd like to study. So of course we do offer Christianity, Catholicism, but we have some other faith traditions as well, Buddhism, Hindu, Judaism. Uh, we even have some fun courses like Jesus in Hollywood. Uh, so it really kind of looks at how Hollywood portrays Jesus. So there's really some fun ways to get those theology requirements out of the way. We also have pre-professional advising programs for those who want to go into the health field or if you want to be a lawyer. These are additional advisors to go along with your major advisor to make sure that you're competitive to get to that next level. So they'll help you take all the necessary prerequisites, help you take the MCAT, LSAT, GRE, whatever you need to take, and really make sure you look fantastic on paper when applying to those graduate level programs. My favorite experience at USD was the small class sizes. Our average class size is only 22 students and you will never have more than 40 students in any of your classes. And that's at that basic English 121 level. We want all of our students to have one-on-one -on -one opportunities with their professors. So all of our courses are taught by professors 97% of them have a terminal degree in their field. They all have office hours outside of their classroom hours. They're easily accessible. Uh, they truly want to get to know their students and truly want to see them be successful. But we want all of our students to really take what they're learning inside of the classroom and apply it outside of the classroom. So we want our students to have some sort of hands-on experiential learning opportunity, whether that be research or internships. And research isn't just within the sciences, it's within all of our majors. And a lot of our professors are continuing to do their own research. So a lot of times they handpick their own students to help them with their research. We have a whole office dedicated to undergraduate research, so you really have the opportunity to be published, co-publish, go to conferences and present your findings as an undergraduate student. We also have an honors program for those who really want to challenge themselves. The top 10% of our admitted first year class will be invited to apply to the honors program. Let's say you're not in that top 10% or maybe that first application wasn't successful. You can apply after your first semester at USD. You just need a minimum of a 3.4 GPA. The honors program is a little bit more rigorous, but really more in depth. The honors classes, the average class size is about uh, 13 to 15 students, so even smaller if you could imagine that. And some of the classes are team taught. So you'd have one class, one subject with two professors from two different academic departments teaching on that one subject. So you're really getting a 360 degree view of a problem and really be able to solve it through two different lenses. Of course, at the end of your senior year, you will have to do a big, huge senior thesis and present it to everyone. But of course, that hard work does come with an honors diploma and honors stole as you walk across the stage. We also understand that the transition from high school to college, it's going to be a big transition. You're not going to be in class from eight to three every day. Uh, you're going to have a lot of free time. So we want to make sure that that transition is smooth. So we do require two years of living on campus. Your first year is going to be in traditional resident halls in what we call our living learning communities. So each residence hall will house one living learning community and these living learning communities are themed. So we have advocate for students who are passionate about social justice. 
Innovate if you're passionate about creating new ways of doing things. Collaborate about civic engagement and teamwork. Cultivate about sustainability and illuminate which is specific to the honors program. I mentioned that you don't apply to a specific major or a specific program. So we will actually be selecting your first semester classes for you based on a lengthy questionnaire. And one of your first semester classes will be focused on that theme that you're living in. You're going to be taking that class with about 18 to 20 other students who you're living with. And the professor teaching that class will also be your initial academic advisor prior to you formally declaring your major. So we just made sure that you have at least one similar interest with every single person you're living with. You have a study buddy study group within your own residence hall, possibly within your own dorm room for at least one of your first semester courses. And you're spending at least two to three times a week with your academic advisor, whether that be in or outside of the classroom. Um, again, we kind of really want to make sure that this transition is smooth. So it really helps to bridge the gap between high school academics and college academics from living at home to living on your own as well. So that's kind of how your first year is going to go. Your second year is going to be more apartment-like style living and the fact that you'd have your own living area, your own kitchen to be able to uh, cook your own food. Uh, but I doubt you're going to use your kitchen. Food is a very, very big deal on our campus. It is absolutely delicious. We have everything from a place that serves all day breakfast to sushi to vegan, um, Italian burgers, burritos, whatever you can think of, we have it on our campus. If you do have any dietary restrictions, you will have no problem eating and eating a variety of food. Our students are pretty well balanced at USD. They're not only involved inside the classroom, but outside of the classroom. We have over 180 different clubs and organizations to get involved in, everything from our accounting society to our skydiving club, whatever you could possibly think of in between, we have it. Uh, so we do have fraternity and sorority life. We have nine uh, sororities, nine fraternities. For those who have been to campus, you know that we do not have any traditional housing on or off campus. Um, I kind of really like how our fraternity and sorority life is set up because uh, if you want that experience, it's here for you. If it's not your thing, you don't feel like you're missing out on some big, huge college experience as only about a quarter of our students participate in fraternities and sororities and a lot of their events are open campus wide, especially their philanthropic events. We're also home to 17 NCAA Division I sports. We play in the West Coast Conference, except for football, we're 1AA, we play in the Pioneer League. Uh, we definitely have a lot of Torero pride on our campus. You'll see Diego the Torero, he's right here. He's our mascot, he makes our sporting events tons of fun. And now y'all know what a Torero is, because usually that's the question that I get. It's very similar to a matador or a bullfighter, but there is one big difference between the matador and the torero. Matador comes from the Spanish verb matar, which means to kill. So unfortunately, the matador kills the bull, the torero just plays with it. So we are very humane here at USD. We also have club sports and intramural sports. If you just want to continue to play a sport that you love, maybe go out and learn a new one. I know our club soccer and club lacrosse teams are actually really good, really competitive. And our intramural sports range from everything traditional, volleyball, basketball, to Quidditch and inner tube water polo. Uh, so we definitely have a lot of fun on campus, but also off campus. We're 15 minutes away from everything you would want to be away from in San Diego. 15 minutes north of downtown, 15 minutes south of La Jolla, 10 minutes away from the beaches. So our students really do enjoy getting off campus and taking full advantage of this awesome city that we live in. Now, we do not permit first year students to bring cars onto campus, but it's still going to be very easy for you to get around. There's a trolley stop right down the street from USD. We have a really great public transportation system. We have zip cars on our campus. Um, and also Uber and Lyft are quite popular among our students too. Things that kind of make USD unique is that we are one of only 47 change maker campuses in the world, excuse me, 45 now. Uh, we were really designated this because of what we do outside of the classroom. This all goes back to our Catholic roots of wanting to be of service to others. So our students do simple things like fundraising to send number two pencils to third world countries. 
something as big as uh, completely developing and building an irrigation system for a village in Sudan. So our students are focused on social justice, social innovation, entrepreneurship, sustainability, and global citizenship as well. Those themes probably sound familiar, like our living learning communities. It really all comes full circle for you. But speaking of that global perspective and global citizenship, we are consistently ranked top 10 in the nation for our study abroad participation. We have over 80 different programs, 30 different countries, six different continents, so you name it, we go there. Very easy for every single major to study abroad as well, as it ranges for three weeks during winter, six weeks over summer, a whole semester, or a whole year abroad. And each study abroad experience is quite different. Uh, so if you do go abroad during the winter or the summer, typically you're going to go with a professor from USD, as well as USD students too. Um, so it's kind of nice that you can have a little bit of familiarity as you go somewhere that is unfamiliar. Uh, but if you do go abroad during the semester, you're probably going to be housed on another campus um, with other students from other universities. And again, each housing um, and living experience will be quite different, whether you live on a campus, you uh, rent an apartment, or you stay with host families to get fully immersed in the culture. We also have five double degree programs with five universities over in Europe. Now, right now, these are limited to business students, and some of them are major specific. So if you are interested in business, I definitely recommend looking into this because you can get two degrees from two different universities, study abroad, do it all in four years. If I could go back in time, I would have definitely taken advantage of this. And we also have our own USD Center in Madrid. This is our one and only campus outside of our main campus. It was just fitting that we went back to our Spanish roots as our university is modeled after the University de Alcala in Madrid. Um, hence our address there. Some fun facts for you to take away. All right, we're done with the fun stuff. Y'all are really excited. You wanna apply to USD, you wanna become a Torero, let me tell you how. So you will see some fall 2020 stats up here. Now, if I haven't stressed that we make things pretty easy, I'm gonna stress it again. We just have one deadline to remember. It's December 15th. We do not do early action or early decision. So for fall 2020, we received about 13,100 applications, accepted about 57% to get an incoming class of about 1013. I like to share fall 2019 as well in a non-COVID-19 year. Uh, so for fall 2019, we received about 13,700 applications, accepted about 52% to get an incoming class of about 1150. Now, what do we need from you to apply? Again, very easy. We just need the common application, your official high school transcripts, one academic letter of recommendation, so either from a teacher or a counselor, and we will accept up to three letters. So your other two can be from teachers, they could be from a community service director, a coach, a priest, pastor, whoever you feel like will give us a good idea of who you are. If you are an international student, we do need a satisfactory TOEFL IELTS, um, or satisfactory TOEFL or IELTS score. And of course, for everyone, that application fee. If that application fee is a hindrance, please reach out to me, let me know. We're, we do offer some fee waivers. And we are test optional, so we do not require SAT or ACT scores. But what are we looking for when we're looking at our applicants? So of course, we are an academic institution, so we do look at your GPA, but we look at it in context of where you go to high school. So we know what is offered there at St. Jean's. We know the rigor of it as well. So we really read you in context of all of that. We look at, you know, did you challenge yourself? We look at your letters of recommendation. We want to make sure we're going to be a good fit for you and you're gonna be a good fit for us as well. And if you do um, provide test scores, we will consider those. Um, but again, they are not required for admission. They are not required for merit scholarships either. And we also understand a lot of people have not even had the opportunity to take a test. So please do not be worried about needing a test score or not having one do not stress at all, especially because we know that you are so much more than just numbers. 
we are looking for future change makers. I told you a little bit about our campus community and what they're passionate about. So that's what we look for when we're looking at your, um, your essays, your extracurricular activities. We look for leadership, community service, your involvement outside of the classroom, um, that global perspective. Does faith play a role in your life? And now we don't expect you to check off every single one of these boxes. But many of the things that you have been involved in will check off quite a few. So definitely use this um, application to brag about yourself. This is not the time to be humble. Brag about yourself. I know the Common App really only gives you 10 spaces to put your involvements and achievements. So I am happy to add a resume to your file. Feel free to email me a resume. I'm happy to add all of that to be reviewed with your application. And we also know that life happens. So we also look at that too. So please let us know if life has happened to you, if you have some extenuating circumstances. We really do consider all of that. And we look at this within the entirety of your application. Uh, so also make sure that you do take a look at our two supplemental questions on the Common App. Uh, you know, we really want to get to know you and if you have done your research about USD. So one of the supplemental questions you're required to write on is which living learning community do you want to be a part of and why? So think about those five themes that I talked about. Go on to our website. Look what it means to be in each one. Choose the one that you are passionate about and share why you're passionate about that. Now, whatever you put on the Common App won't necessarily be the one that you're going to be put into if you do choose to attend USD. That will come later down the line in a lengthy questionnaire after May 1st. Um, you'll fill that out and that will determine your living learning community. Now, the other question you're required to write on, you get your pick of three questions. One of them is about change making. How are you going to be a change maker? One of them is about envisioning 2024. That's our 75th anniversary as a university. So we have our plan on where we want to be as a university by then. We kind of want to know the same about you. What do you want to have accomplished by 2024? And the other one is about diversity, inclusion, and equity and how you foster that in your daily life. So with those three questions, choose the one that you really want to talk about. Again, share something you're excited to share with us. And now let's talk about the Torero Promise because we make this especially easy for our Torero Promise schools. This is a guaranteed admissions program. So as long as you have had at least a 3.7 recalculated weighted GPA by the end of your junior year, and you've successfully taken um, at least three uh, honors AP or um, college level classes by the end of your junior year. Now, I know many of you didn't have that opportunity, so we have been very flexible with that. Um, and of course, have no disciplinary record, submit the Common App by December 15th, that is all it takes to have a guaranteed admissions to USD from St. Jean's. I think all of our students have had that opportunity for three honors or AP classes. So they should be golden on that. <laughs> Beautiful. So then as long as you've met that, you have a guaranteed admissions to USD, just submit that application and you can count on it. Now I do want to um, re-emphasize that it is recalculated based off of G, uh, USD scale. And I'm happy to work with you all and let you know um, where your GPA may land. It's going to be pretty similar to what it uh, currently is on your transcripts. But again, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to really give you a good idea of where your GPA may be. Now, Kelly went over a lot of this stuff already. Um, so tuition is about $52,000 a year, room and board's about 15. But I really wanted to talk about the merit scholarships that she briefly touched upon. These are awarded to the top 35 to 40% of our admitted first year class, and they range between 18 and $25,000. And those are renewable each year as long as you maintain a 3.0 GPA. Uh, now, these are mainly based on academics, 
So for fall of 2020, the average admitted weighted GPA was about a 4.0 weighted. Um, the middle 50% ranged between a 3.83 and a 4.24. Again, take these numbers with a grain or two of salt because it is very relative on where you go to school. Um, we know not every school is the same. We know not every school does it the same. That's why we recalculate the GPAs. But of course, we do add in some of those change maker factors when we are considering merit scholarships. Kelly talked about the FAFSA. Make sure that you do get that in by March 2nd. It does open up on October 1st. And about 76% of our students are receiving some sort of financial aid. We've also partnered with Raise Me. Uh, this is a wonderful micro scholarship website. So you can input your grades, input your test score, or sorry, not your test scores, input your grades, input what you've been involved in outside of the classroom, and this will all add up to a dollar amount. And USD will match every single dollar that you earn on Raise Me. You must um, follow us or submit your earnings by December 1st of your application year. So for you seniors, you must submit those earnings by December 1st. Now, I, I like to explain Raise Me a little bit further. It's a really good guesstimate of what scholarship you may be eligible for. So for example, if you earn $10,000 on Raise Me and you are awarded the Presidential Merit Scholarship of $18,000, USD has covered the Raise Me Scholarship with that $18,000. So I always like to make sure that you know that this is not in addition to merit scholarships, but the merit scholarship could very well cover this. But we know that college is an investment. It's an investment in your future. So we have a wonderful career development team who's going to make sure your future is going to be bright. They're going to help you build your resume, build your cover letter, do mock interviews with you. They put on internship fairs, career fairs every semester. They were even able to do it um, last semester virtually. So they are being very creative with making this work for our students. They also do Torero treks where they will bring a group of students to a major city in the U.S. and introduce them to companies that are there. So we've gone to Seattle to see Starbucks, Portland to see Nike, Bay Area to see Google and Adobe. Our students are meeting with CEOs, CFOs, alumni who work for those companies, and they come out of these experiences with internships and careers for after they graduate. I really like this website, sandiego.edu slash career outcomes. It has a majors drop down, so you could see where students have gone off to graduate school or where they're currently working today. So you kind of know what kind of career you're going to get set up for with that degree from USD. And these stats on the right hand side, these are based off of those who graduated in May of 2019. And we do get about a 75% response rate. So the numbers are pretty accurate up here. So within six months, 92% of those who graduated were either employed, fully enrolled in a graduate program, or were doing some sort of full-time service, um, like going into the Peace Corps or Jesuit Volunteer Corps. And now my favorite stat is the one at the bottom. Out of those who were employed, 95% of them received at least one job offer, either before graduation or within three months. And the big blue chunk is before graduation. So proof's really in the numbers right there that companies understand what kind of education we're providing our students with, and they come onto our campus seeking our students out. Y'all have been thrown a lot of information today. A lot of it is easier to digest than some other pieces, uh, but what kind of questions do you all have? Jackie, that was very, very thorough. I would write down a question and then you would answer it. Um, the only one that I had left over for you was, um, have you guys decided how long you're going to be test optional? It, it's, it's pretty much set in place. Um, I might be jumping the gun here, but we are possibly considering going test blind for this year. Oh. Wow. Um, and it would be this year only, but we are going to um, stay test optional. Wow. Okay, great. Yeah. But again, don't quote me on that. If this comes back to me. 
<laughs> That's totally understandable. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, if not, that's uh, Jackie's email right there, and she is extremely accessible. I've emailed her several times. Um, and then also just a reminder that if you are very interested in that recalculation of the GPA, you can email her and she can do that for you. Um, any last uh, thoughts or words, Principal Zaleski? <gasps> I would love to say that, gosh, what a golden opportunity we have uh, with this partnership with USD. I kind of feel, you know, listening to the charism stories, listening to the foundation stories, listening to what they do with students and for students to help them grow as um, independent people ready to transform the world. I would say we're the nursery ground for USD. <laughs> so, I think you definitely um, want to take a closer look at this this campus uh, for sure, because once you walk on it, as Sister projected, you will fall in love with the campus. It's so gorgeous. Um, but also the professionalism of their majors is amazing. So do not sell USD short. Do not be sticker shocked. If, if you're like looking at those numbers going, oh my gosh, um, I get it, but we are committed to helping you with the scholarship USD is putting a lot into helping students make this um, an affordable dream come true. So please continue to look um, at USD as one of your top choices. Little yeah. endorsement USD, I'm not even getting any kickback on that. <laughs> <laughs> and Jackie, I don't see any new questions in the chat box, so I think you didn't, oh, never mind, Marianne has one for I love it. Marianne, go there. <laughs> I really want to. Um, hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, how are you guys, like, dealing with COVID? I don't know if I was, like, late to that part, but are you guys, like, having any in-class sessions or anything like that? And then also, like, are you doing study abroad, like, right now, which I pro which I doubt you probably are, but I was just wondering. <laughs> yeah, great questions. Um, so we didn't really talk too much uh, about what we're doing right now in this uh, new COVID-19 world that we're all living in. Uh, but we actually decided to start the semester remotely. Um, we also shifted our calendar a little bit. So we started in mid-August. Usually we start right before or right after Labor Day, and we go all the way through um, mid-December. But we decided to start in early August, and then that way all of our students are going to be done right before Thanksgiving. So we really wanted to try to alleviate travel um, for our students, as well as um, try to avoid what we're all possibly expecting of the flu and the COVID overlap that will, fingers crossed, hopefully not hit us as hard as, as we're expecting. Uh, but we actually recently made an announcement about a few weeks ago, probably right around Labor Day, um, once San Diego got out, off of the watch list, we decided to bring our students back onto campus. So actually this past weekend about um, 650 to 700 students moved onto campus. Classes for the most part will um, still remain remote for those who decided to stay at home. Um, but we are now offering some in-class opportunities for those um, who are either living here in San Diego or who have moved back onto campus. Um, but those are kind of few and far between. I would say it's more of some of the labs have moved um, to go in person, but that's because our labs are really small in the first place. Um, I think my largest lab was maybe me and 11 other people, and it's very, very big at USD. Um, in regards to studying abroad, unfortunately, you know, with all the travel bans, um, we just weren't able to send students abroad. So studying abroad has uh, ceased at the moment, but we really are hoping to bring that back up very, very soon. Um, and hopefully going to bring students onto, you know, more students onto campus in the spring. Um, that is kind of our goal, but of course, you know, our, we're, we're really rolling with the punches and doing the best we can as I, all of us really are um, in this new world that we're living in. Okay, thank you. Of course. We can definitely completely understand that. Okay, any other questions for Jackie? 
Well, I'll just say one, one last thing. I went to a small private Catholic high school in Los Angeles. And for me, USD just seemed like such a good fit. I couldn't imagine myself having gone to college, um, you know, being in lecture halls full of 300 people. But that's what's great about every university is every university is different and it offers different things and every person is different. There's some of my friends who are excited and that's what they really thought about college and their experience and they wanted to have that big lecture hall experience. But for me, it was important to go to a place where I had access to my professors. That was a similar learning environment to what I was used to in high school. Um, I've actually been involved with USD for uh, 18 years. <laughs> my brother went to U started at USD in 2002, and immediately I felt a part of this Torero family. And we really are a family. Uh, this place has truly been a second home for me, and I really hope that you know one day we can get back to doing on-campus tours, and you can all feel that experience too. You're more than welcome to come onto campus right now, but again, please take it with a grain or two of salt as, as it is much more quieter than usual. We do require that you wear a mask. You'll probably have to go through a quick health screening. You know, we're gonna ask you, are you sick? Take your temperature. Uh, but you are more than welcome to come and walk around campus at this time if you would like to come down to San Diego. So I'd like to put that out there too, um, but definitely walk around. It is absolutely gorgeous. We, I still think we're number one most beautiful campus, but you know, that's the, I might be biased. But again, thank you all so much for taking time out of your evening to be here and listen to me and Kelly speak. Um, again, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email address is up here. As you can tell, we're still working from home, um, but definitely reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. If you have questions that I can't answer, I can at least point you in the right direction of someone who can. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you so much, Jackie.